let us talk about what I think is the biggest scary part of the whole global climate change picture, which has to do with uh, frozen methane clathrates in the Arctic. So basically, methane gets trapped in uh, various forms. One of them is frozen methane under the permafrost on land and under the sea floor. And there is such an immense amount of this stuff trapped that it dwarfs any contribution that humans would make um, to global warming. And the problem is that the positive... So just, just because it's not a word that I am familiar with except from hearing you talk about it, methane clathrates is yep. the word you're using. Um, <clears throat> and uh, people may also have heard things like gas hydrate, hydrate. or even um, fire ice yeah. in some contexts. Well, it's, it's all the same thing. If I thought synonyms. about it, I would have uh, had a video. You can actually see um, in certain places in the Arctic um, methane on fire emerging from... Mm -hmm. Uh, sediments and things. Uh, so anyway, you can look that up um, and you can find it. But yeah, it's basically these uh, structures, these methane structures that hold, uh, they hold methane stable in a frozen form. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crystalline structure. Yeah, it that's involves, holding methane. involves water and anyway, uh, mm -hmm. they're also chemically interesting. I don't know if you scroll up, maybe we can find I mean, this it. Is, I, I, this is just Wikipedia. Yeah, knows, but, but. but they should have a picture of one chemically somewhere. Mm, maybe, oh, not. maybe not. Not so much. Okay. Oh, In any case, there. I mean, that's just a. That's oh yeah, there you go. It's, it's really too tiny. small, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. It's um, meaningless to almost everyone. So I believe that's going to be the methane there in the center. Um, anyway. But anyway, this is a very potent methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, and there's a huge amount of it tied up in these fro frozen clathrates in the Arctic, and some of it's under permafrost, some of it's under the sea floor, but the danger is that it's, in a, it's stable because it's frozen. And as the earth warms, it is going to be released at some rate. And what we have seen, there's a particular, there's a Russian uh, academic outfit that does yeah. a lot of studying of methane releases, and they've found these... In Siberia, mostly. Yeah, yeah. In, uh, yeah. in the uh, the ocean. Um, it's, a, it's, a, oh. it's a marine... Census. Oh, maybe different. So they found yeah. these huge plumes of methane, and the problem is we don't have good baseline data. Like, do you expect huge plumes of methane? If so, are they more common? Are they bigger? We don't know. I, probably we know more than last time I checked in on this, but we because we don't have a hundred years of data on these methane plumes because in general they're not of consequence. Mm -hmm. um, we it's hard to say how alarmed to be about the fact that there's suddenly huge amounts of methane bubbling up in the Arctic. But the danger is that we could get to a place where positive feedback would take climate change completely out of our control. Because to the extent that it gets warmer than historically it has been, it will release... Faster. Yeah. Warmer, faster. Mm -hmm. It will release a bunch of methane that was frozen that would otherwise have stayed frozen. That methane, because it's a very potent greenhouse gas, will cause the following year to be that much warmer. Mm -hmm. um, that following year will then yeah. release more methane. And so what you'll get is eventually a release of a huge fraction of that stuff. And at the point that that happens, there's basically nothing we can do. Yep. Right. This is no longer a question of us controlling climate change. It's a question of us adapting to whatever is coming mm -hmm. at whatever magnitude. Yep. Um, and so uh, that uh, dragon's breath hypothesis is, or the That's what cla clathrate gun hypothesis, the idea that it would go off like a gun, mm. um, is a very frightening prospect. And those of us who are most concerned about this um, happening are have our eye on this. And my mm -hmm. contention has been the day on which climate change is no longer something that we could control, even in principle, it will not make the news. We will not know it has happened. We will not know that threshold has been crossed. It will just happen, and then mm -hmm. we will live downstream of it. But it might not even be deducible in retrospect, right? Like, you know, 5, 10, 20 years later. I mean, right. pinpoint it a little bit, but... Um, I think we will have a sense of it now. We're doing enough monitoring, mm -hmm. but it's the the point is it's a it's a threshold we will cross, but it's not you know it's not a threshold that can be named specifically. I believe in the mm -hmm. present, it's too too complex. So 
what emerged, and actually I owe uh, my good friend Kevin um, a shout out for pointing me towards this, but Zach, could you put up the, uh, actually before you put up the article, could you put up the pictures of the craters, the Yamo craters? You can just start with any any of it. Okay, so this is the floor of one of these craters in the Yamal Peninsula of Siberia. Um, could you go to the next one? Uh, here's some people rappelling down in, so you get a sense for how big these craters are. Go to the next one. Okay, so here you can see from above. And uh, those of you, I know I talked about this on the podcast with Katie Herzog. Um, these craters are... I believe, very ominous. And I think that the images of them ought to be on everybody's mind. I don't see these images nearly often enough, given what they suggest. Um, the, these craters were discovered. Size? I mean, I guess we saw a person saw, in the last one. So yeah. we're talking a couple hundred yeah, feet across? Yeah, a hundred feet across. Okay. These were discovered, ironically enough, by fossil fuel petroleum workers who were traveling over the Yamal Peninsula by helicopter. And they mm. saw these holes in the ground. Initially, we did not know the explanation for them. The dragon's breath hypothesis that this was somehow an explosive release of methane um, was tested and turns out to be the best hypothesis, probably true, for what created them. And the idea is this is such an unpopulated region that there are no people around to report, oh yeah, we heard that and we went and looked and that was never there before. Right. Like there, now, there are no eyewitnesses to these correct. craters being formed. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um now, I will say that the Yamal Peninsula is pockmarked by geological processes. So mm -hmm. how rare this actually is, I don't know. But it is certainly rare within geological experience. In fact, it's so rare that this particular formation does not have a name, right? So we have names for other things. And in fact, there were uh, hypotheses that this was a pingo, pingo being a geological formation that arises when water freezes and ejects uh, dirt out of a hole, um, but it doesn't look like this. It's not explosive, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like it's a cracking mass of dirt, and it would be there rather than kaboom. But, yeah, there would be dirt remaining. Right. So, um, so this is not a pingo. Um, it turns out it's probably due to the explosive release of methane, and that's very frightening because what it tells you is, God damn it, there's you know there's stuff going on on the methane release from the Arctic Channel that is profound in terms of its scale and new enough that we don't have a geological name for it, mm -hmm. right? As studied as geology is, this is new. So that's scary. And yeah. we ought to be very worried about it. So in light of that having... Yeah, why not? Uh, that's still the guy repelling. Is there a fourth picture? Okay. Um, so now could you show the article? Uh, so... My friend Kevin forwarded me this article, which I cannot read at that scale. Um, yeah. And so anyway, this um, suggests something which may be the rare piece of good news that we get on the climate change front. What this uh, article describes is the discovery initially about tides and their effect on methane release. And basically the idea was the higher so the, the tide... So the moon here in the, in the headline title is just about the moon controlling the tides. Yes. Okay. That basically the moon's effect on the height of the water column above the frozen clathrates mm -hmm. controls how much release. The more water is standing on top, the less likely the methane is to be released, which stands to reason, certainly. So there's, it's not a binary, are you covered with water or are you not? It's actually the depth of the water by which you are covered is predictive. This is a continuous variable. The depth of the water by which you are covered um, is actually, uh, the, the greater the depth, the more protective against uh, clathrate release. Right, is which the, is is what is yes. observed, or it's a hypothesis? No, no, this has now been tested. Okay, now of course, always could sure. be reversed. But yes, the idea is the more water that's sitting on top of these uh, these methane hydrates, the less likely they are to be released. The smaller the plumes that we get, mm -hmm. and the reason that that is good news is because it suggests a negative feedback. Mm -hmm. on methane release, which is to say, if you take the scenario that we described up top, where methane release or something else causes the temperature to warm, that warming temperature then causes more methane to be released, which causes it to warm further. That's a positive feedback. Right. There's no controlling that. It will be controlled by some other process. 
The water on top, however, is something sea levels, you all know, are slated to rise if the temperature goes up. Why? Because the ice that currently holds a lot of that water will flow off the land and into the sea, causing elevation and sea level. That's a bad thing, especially if you live on the coast. It's a bad thing for lots of reasons. But it may have this positive outgrowth, which is it will increase the depth of the water on top of the methane that is the greatest danger in this whole global climate change story. So and therefore, the, the, more, the, the warmer it gets, the more water will be on top of the methane clathrates, the harder it will be uh, for it to be liberated. Mm. So it may be uh, right. a buffer rather than an accelerant of climate change. Wow. That, so that, that would be terrific news. Uh, these clathrates, uh, which are, it sounds like, littered across the what peninsula? The Yamal. The Yamal Peninsula in Siberia. Um, this is this is tidelands, or it's dry land but low lying, such that even with relatively small amounts of sea level rise, they would potentially be submerged. Um, as always, when we do this off the cuff, yeah. uh, there's the danger of my saying something sure. dumb, but it is uh, Arctic permafrost. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, it's dry land, um, low lying, and uh, basically it's tundra. Tundra is, I think, the but, right so term. So Arctic permafrost, which could therefore become sort of marshy if things warm up. Right. Maybe, depending on where the water table is and what the elevation is and all Yeah, this. and I, I have no yeah. doubt, actually, that some of it is marshy some of the time, but there's, mm -hmm. a, perma, there's a permafrost layer um, that is uh, buffered from the sun and uh, below which resides an awful lot of methane, apparently. Oh, yeah. the test, I should say, the test in those craters involved descending into those craters to detect the levels of methane, which were sky high. Mm. Um, so anyway, yes, a rare piece of good news. One, And, you know, I, I must say in, in the better discussions of climate change that I uh, haven't done it recently, but I participated in years ago, there was always this sort of hope that buried somewhere mm -hmm. in the complex system that uh, controls the Earth's temperature was a hidden feedback that we had missed that could work in the right direction. Yeah. And while this probably isn't sufficient, in fact, you know, it is the warming that, it is the rise of sea level <laughs> that brings the protection, so that's not a good thing. Right. But nonetheless, it is a feedback that at least I had never heard of before um, that would work in our favor rather than against us. Well, just fabulous. Hope it's true. Yep. Um, hope we don't need to rely on it. Yeah. It would, mm -hmm. well, be great for us to get our ducks in a row one way or the other. Um, m my sense, having thought a lot about all that we might do, is that um, mitigating the release of greenhouse gases, it's too little too late. Mm -hmm. um, and that really our only plug and play hope for reversing what we know is coming is fusion power fusion power if we can if we can get there actually would allow us to pull carbon out of the atmosphere right you could pull actively pull it out yeah you could pull mm -hmm. it out of the atmosphere the way trees do for example mm -hmm. but you could do it as a result of a process in which you could basically use huge amounts of energy liberated from uh between uh these uh subatomic particles, um, and that you could use that, you could make building materials out of <laughs> CO2 in the atmosphere and use it for something useful and that lower the temperature. <laughs> well, yeah, the problem is we're not investing nearly enough in fusion power uh, to get there in time. I don't know why we're not. I cannot imagine why we are not investing more in it. Um, we are investing, you know, small not tens of billions of dollars which sounds like a lot until you realize no, that we are to... investing hundreds of billions of dollars you know globally in things like text messages um so anyway yes we are being very foolish not to pursue fusion yeah um hopefully we'll get there